Good evening, students. So today we will learn about bargaining power and diplomacy. I'll not go much into the details of the previous chapters. I remember last class I asked you to go through chapter two and I told you that I'll be asking you questions on that and probably I'll ask any one of you to recapitulate on the chapter two that is on the chapter chapter two that is on the models of diplomacy and so on. I asked you to just uh, recapitulate last time, but I think if we have time, we will do it during the end of the session. However, since this chapter is pretty small, uh, so we will try to finish up with the lecture and then I will ask you a question on chapter two, that is types of models of diplomacy or international diplomacy. Well, today we are going to learn about bargaining power and diplomacy and on the other hand, we are going to learn about the functions of a diplomat. Now, what is bargaining power? I'm sure you have heard about this term. To bargain, what is to bargain? It is a kind of, you know, negotiating something or negotiating a deal where you also propose something to another person and probably you will let go something and you will agree for something greater and take it from the other person just to put it in simple terms so it is basically uh you know the relative capacity of each person to propose terms or conditions for a particular deal and to accept something and to give up something in order to gain something bigger. So therefore, uh, what is bargaining power then? And why is it important? Of course, it is important so that a person, you know, gets something bigger. The person sees a bigger picture. Okay, the person sees a bigger picture and then tries to overlook some other smaller aspects or some th something that is trivial in nature or something that he can really be oblivious of or he can be forgetful of. So what is this bargaining power and what does bargaining help you? Bargaining helps a person to come to an agreement. So how is it important for diplomacy? Naturally, an important characteristic of diplomacy is or a skill that is required for international diplomacy is negotiation. So negotiation is an important uh, called, uh, I wouldn't say a byproduct, or I would rather call it, um, you know, it is a part of bargaining skill. So negotiation is a part of bargaining skill. It is attached to bargain. It's like the close sister of bargaining skill I could call it like that or a close sibling brother or sister whatever you want to call it so you know a close you know sibling to bargaining skills because negotiation I believe is part of bargaining because bargaining involves not just negotiation but also like your state of mind like how is the state of mind of the person? I'm just telling you, giving you a general idea before we go through the the you know the slides just to just to set the perspective. Are you understanding me? So that you will just understand the simple uh, you know factors, so that you will you know I'll uh, you know lead you towards understanding how bargaining power and diplomacy are related. So just to set the perspective. Uh, I'd want you to know that bargaining skills, they involve negotiation. Apart from that, even the state of mind of a person. Um, you know, I want you to listen to me carefully. And also, I want you to think about this. Just think about a situation where a person has to bargain. So what will the person, uh, like, say you are there to bargain something. So what is your state of mind? Naturally, the state of mind of a person, like how the person would, you know, advance his arguments or advance his point towards receiving something, the, the art of communication, how the person puts forth strategically his viewpoint, then you know, how he plans or he, she, he or she plans the words or you know plans to put forth something and how they create value out of that particular situation, they strategize, they reflect 
and they negotiate. So bargaining, therefore, involves all these factors of communication, planning, value creation, strategy, reflecting upon particular idea and your emotional intelligence. Why we are talking about emotional intelligence here? This is not there in the slides, okay? This is just a general idea I'm giving you. I want you to understand, why are we talking about emotional intelligence? Emotional intelligence is a state of mind of a person, how a person reacts to a, you know, a particular situation. Some people react too quickly. Some people take time to react. Some people react in a manner which is not palatable, which is not really welcome. Are you understanding me? So in international diplomacy, bargaining power plays a very important role where bargaining involves all these factors of negotiation, emotional intelligence, planning, value creation, strategizing, you know, your words or whatever you want to put forth uh, and, you know, reflecting upon certain ideas and, you know, putting it forth in a manner diplomatically so that the other person would understand your viewpoint. Now, imagine a situation, I will not take the name of countries and um, if you are following the news, following the news, so I'm sure you will, you know, I'm sure you know about certain situation, what is happening in the international arena. So if a person comes to the bargaining table, imagine a situation and is always annoyed or is always, uh, you know, trying to talk about me, 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 me. Or, or when someone says something, you know, say in an international um, or a global meeting, the other person, probably that's a diplomat of some other country, just reacts to a particular sentence spoken by some other diplomat of another country and uses certain words which are not welcome. Probably it would, it would trespass even the law. So therefore, emotional intelligence is a must where a person keeps their mind calm and is able to advance their side of the story or their arguments or their defense, whatever it may be, or their point of view in a manner that is not necessarily pleasing to everyone, but in a manner so as to not trespass the rights of another person. For example, one must not insult a person while talking. It need not be direct, but it can be interpretatively, you know, direct or indirect, or it could be something that a person unknowingly speaks about the culture of another country or a nation or the plan of action that is taken by some other country or so on. So, you know, the international negotiate, negotiating table is, um, you know, a sensitive arena. I would call, like to call it a sensitive arena. It's a sensitive, uh, not a playground, rather, a sensitive arena, a sensitive negotiating table where a good diplomat has to maintain his emotional IQ. He has to maintain his emotional intelligence, he or she has to maintain an emotional intelligence, should not go overboard, should not get over emotional, should not trespass the rights of, of uh, uh, rights of another nation or another diplomat or another human being, should be careful in voicing out their concerns. So that is the reason we are talking about bargaining power because the one of the major roles of diplomacy or international diplomacy is to negotiate that is use bargaining power so as to achieve certain common goals it can be common international goals or it could be a national goal where probably that particular diplomat is trying to project their country to the world. Example, say in the recent UNGA, that's, you know, just was taking place recently, and I'm not sure whether it is there today, 
but well i i remember it was just going on until two days back i i mean i tried to check it at least up to two days back so that is a 77th uh, meeting so i was talking about how they were advancing their arguments and how they were proposing certain uh you know certain solutions to certain in international problems and certain deliberations that were advanced so all such things happen at certain meetings or certain conferences or especially at UN general meetings and so on. So emotional intelligence also plays a very important role. So bargaining power involves negotiation and negotiation in terms of communication, emotional intelligence, planning of the arguments, value creation, strategy, reflection, and so on. So bargaining helps countries to come to a conclusion or to draw conclusions, are you understanding me, and come to an agreement. For example, when we are talking about international law, much of the international law is made up of treaties and conventions. So how are all these treaties and conventions, you know, really signed? Or how does it become a pact? P-A-C-T, pact. How does it become a pact? Or uh, how does it become, you know, a, a, an understanding between the parties? How does it become an agreement? That is through bargaining. They bargain and then they come to a conclusion. And in international law, it is important for the purpose of enforcing a particular convention or a treaty that state parties must ratify the treaty. That means all of them must be a signatory to the treaty or whoever is a signatory to the treaty. It is incumbent upon that person to follow the terms or the conditions that are mentioned in the treaty or the principles that are laid down in a particular treaty. So that is how treaties are followed. And that is how treaties become a part of international law. So bargaining plays a very important role even in um, uh, you know, ratification of treaties, you can call it even that, I mean, you can even say that way, that um, bargaining power plays a very important role even in uh, ratification of treaties, that is bringing all, that is, you know, arriving at a particular consensus and state parties affects, affixing their signature or, you know, being a signatories to that particular treaty. Sometimes it happens that countries, they talk, talk and negotiate and it goes on and on and on and they do not arrive at a particular situation. So that kind of a situation is called a dead lock. It is called a dead lock situation. Dead lock, L-O-C-K, dead lock situation. Are you understanding me? So... A deadlock situation is a situation where they have they did not manage to arrive at a particular conclusion and they had, you know, there is no concurrence among the parties. They could not concur on a particular opinion or whatever on a particular, you know, decision that had to be taken or whatever was brought to the negotiating table. They were not able to, um, you know, come to a particular decision. So that's how that kind of a situation is called a deadlock. However, if they come to a conclusion and they are ready to, you know, forge ahead towards a particular goal together, they're able to forge ahead together. So then they ratify a treaty that is the affix their signatures on a particular convention or a treaty and say, yes, we are willing to, you know, um, we are willing to, um, or we consent to the terms and conditions of this treaty, or we are consenting to go by the terms of this treaty. So that is how treaties are, uh, you know, ratified and so on. So bargaining power plays a very important role in treaties and conventions as well. And their treaties and conventions are an important part of international law. So having said the perspective, now let's go through our slides and uh, see what is this bargaining power. So I believe you have heard me so long. 
and I've explained to you in simple terms what is this bargaining power and how it is important and why it's important and I've set the perspective. Now let's go through our slides. So bargaining power is a relative ability of parties to negotiate and arrive at a conclusion over a subject that may have been debatable. Probably it's a debatable issue. So this has always been a focal point or an important point of international diplomacy and has always played a pivotal role specifically in international conflicts. Further, international diplomacy strategizes joint action to, to achieve a particular agenda of national or international in, uh, interests. For instance, taking a stand on territorial dispute or climate change. For example, they're deciding on matters relating to territorial dispute. And territorial disputes, like for example, what are there are border disputes where you know. There are common borders, like for example, India and Pakistan, or India and China, or Azerbaijan and uh, Armenia. So they have border disputes, and that's how, you know, we are almost heading towards a much graver international situation, uh, where I would not really, you know, <laughs> try to say certain words, but I, I believe we are moving towards a much more graver situation uh, in the world that is with respect to Ukraine and Russia. Well, we'll see what happens. But however, all this kind of problems, territorial disputes, border disputes, and that's how sometimes it leads to annexation or climate change. Other, This is climate change is something else relating to climate. And climate change, again, I mean, how there are different treaties related to climate change. There are different conventions related to climate change. And there are different conferences that are held with respect to climate change. And also, just for your knowledge, there is, uh, you know, there's a, uh, Intergovernmental panel at the international level, which is organized by the UN, of course, IPCC. That's just coming to my mind now. IPCC, that is Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Yeah. So there is a body which is now actually studying uh, climate change and it's preparing reports on that and it advances its arguments and it, it tries to suggest things how to, you know, combat, for example, global warming and so on. So again, when there is part of, uh, there are meetings, so these international diplomats have to participate in certain meetings, such as COP twenty, COP twenty six, which already took place, 27, 28, which is now due, or twenty eight, uh, twenty seven is due to take place in Egypt, and twenty eight, I think, is due to take place in UAE. Well, you can just cross check the facts. I'm talking about COP. 27 COP, abbreviated COP, COP 27, COP 28. Just for your knowledge, you can just, uh, you know, Google it out and there is, I'm sure you'll find information. Well, so international diplomacy strategizes joint action to achieve a particular agenda of national or international interest, for instance, taking a stand or coming to a conclusion on a particular, uh, whatever, it could be, uh, you know, particular, you know, whatever understanding with respect to territorial dispute or climate change or particular proposal, you know, whatever it is, and they come to a particular conclusion. A conclusion could be, a, or a, it could be even a deadlock situation with respect to territorial dispute or climate change. Next is negotiation. Of course, we all know that has always existed from time immemorial. And that that is, we don't, we cannot even, uh, I mean, we do not know really when it began. So negotiation has always been there. I feel it has always been, it has always existed from the time of creation. Negotiation has always existed. And diplomatic negotiation and bargaining power are certainly not new concepts. Now, negotiation in the area of diplomatic relations sometimes may reflect a situation of dividing a kick between two nations, but neither of them gets it and the matter remains suspended. So this is a deadlock situation. So sometimes diplomatic, uh, you know, negotiations is required for a particular, for deciding on a particular aspect, which may look, you know, voluptuous and beautiful on the outside. And there are two nations who are looking at a particular, you know, convincing situation and but they are not able to arrive at a particular situation on that particular 
uh, you know, aspect, which is quite convincing and which looks voluptuous like a cake and looks delectable like a cake. And they're not able to come to a situation. So it's such as a problem where you have something good in hand and countries negotiate over that. But sometimes it does happen, however beautiful it may seem, but still they're not able to arrive at a particular situation because everybody wants it and everybody is fighting for it and they're not able to divide it. So that's where negotiation plays a very important role. Sometimes it may even fail or remain stranded or suspended. That is a deadlock situation. Again, for this, the best example is two countries fighting over a common border. Naturally, no one will give up over the border. I gave you some examples earlier of border disputes where the world is really looking at certain countries and they're watching. The world is watching at certain countries who are fighting over border disputes. And in fact, those particular nations are also waiting to see what's going to happen. In fact, as far as we know, it's not going to solve because you know, one country says that a particular portion belongs to them. Another country says, no, you should be giving it to us. Or they want to be independent, totally an independent uh, you know, territory. That's how this problem has started, even about Russia and Ukraine. If you go back to the history, you would say USSR was just one big unit. I mean, it was, you know, a united country, USSR, it was altogether one. And that's how they, you know, they disintegrated the certain political history background for that. And, you know, you go through it, you will understand. You need to read certain things uh, so that you will understand what it is and what is the importance of the subject that you're learning. So though the parties at the negotiating table have no complete control over the subject in question, however, they certainly do possess the ability to negotiate and are granted the maximum leverage, that is, to the, to the optimum level to negotiate in the best interest of the state parties they are representing. Next is trade-offs are a part of negotiation times. What are these trade-offs? Sometimes you give up on particular aspects so that where you're looking at a bigger picture so that you would gain something uh, reasonably big for a particular country. So trade-offs are a part of negotiation at times, and it is the ability to give up an aspect that may be of relevant substance, aiming at a broader picture and gaining something of much greater value in return. So trade-offs also a part of uh, negotiation. Diplomats therefore need to possess the skill to negotiate and use bargaining power as an effective tool during diplomatic negotiations. Countries may forego something to gain something valuable in return. Diplomatic bargaining may be bilateral or multilateral. It can be between two countries or it can be between two and more countries or it could be between a group of countries. It is when the bargaining power yields little or no results, then the conflicts between nations remain unresolved and may lead to a particular way. Thereby, bargaining and negotiation is a substantial tool in international diplomatic relationship. Therefore, we say that it is a, you know, a relevant tool or it is a substantial tool in international diplomatic relationship. Now, the last part for this class is functions of a diplomat. This is quite a small chapter. Normally, the chief diplomat of any nation is its president. Remember this. The chief diplomat of any nation is its president. president. Now, who is granted constitutional powers, diplomatic powers and diplomatic immunity? So in India, each state, for example, I'm giving an example. For example, in India, each state has a constitutional head called the governor who also enjoys certain diplomatic powers and immunities just like the president. Now, that apart, like how in other parts of the world, certain cabinet ministers are there, foreign ministers, ambassadors, foreign service officers, and all of these are you know, considered as diplomats. And there are other specially appointed envoys who also come within the ambit of the definition of diplomat. So there are different types of diplomatic missions as well. You must have heard of high commission. So high commission is normally an embassy of a commonwealth country, which is located in another 
Commonwealth country and then embassy. Embassy is a diplomatic mission which is located in the capital city of another country that generally offers a full range of services, including consular services. Then we have got consulate, which is similar to a consulate general, which provides a particular limited range of services. Then you have this consulate general offices, which is located in a major cities, certain major cities, of course, providing some consulate services. Next is consulate headed by an honorary consul. That is, they provide a limited range of services. And then you have permanent missions, which is a special diplomatic mission to represent at a major international organization. So these are the types, some of the types or the prominent types of diplomatic missions. Then there are categories of diplomats. In 1815, the Congress of Vienna codified customary rules of international law on the ranks of diplomatic representatives. So after the UN was established, the International Law Commission was entrusted with, with the task of codifying the law pertaining to diplomacy. Then the draft of the International Law Commission, they put forth and they submitted it to the General Assembly of the UNO, which convened the 1961 Vienna Conference and adopted the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations. We have a separate chapter on this Vienna Convention. So this Vienna Convention classified the Office of Diplomats into four categories. One, they said that you can classify it as ambassadors accredited to the head of state, envoys who are ministers accredited to the head of state, and charges the affairs accredited to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. What are the important functions of a diplomat? Uh, just a reminder, in case we get disconnected, please join back. Next is representation, representing the country or the state. So one of the function of diplomat is to represent, of course. So representing the country or the state party or a particular territory or an agenda, at the international forefront. So that's one of the major role of a diplomat. Next is to negotiate. He participates in negotiations. So diplomats bargain and negotiate on behalf of state parties. So that state, on behalf of state parties, there is an error there and they are indeed the mouthpiece of state parties and diplomats are trained with the skill of negotiation. Next is they promote amity and aid coalition building. So diplomats are expected to represent state parties and act as ambassadors of goodwill, that is to help them to promote friendship, strategize building good international global relations. So diplomats are expected to have good knowledge or considerable knowledge of different nations and their cultures and follow local, national and international protocols while hosting diplomatic guests from other nations. The next part is of course consular functions. What are consular functions? All you know, um, um, you know, all functions pertaining to like passports, um, you know, issuing of passports or whatever, issuing or renewal or birth death res registration, marriage registration. Sometimes when the, I mean, the couple probably is living in another country and then they, they go to the, the consulate of their own country in another country. So these are some of the functions and the other allied consular functions, of course, they perform. Next is reports. They prepare reports. They participate in international conventions, conferences, meetings, and prepare reports. They are observant. They observe the meeting. They Then accordingly, they prepare a report and submit it to their respective government. Then is protection of national interest. The major role of a diplomat is, of course, to protect his own country's interest, that is the national interest of the country for which he is appointed to be the mouthpiece. So it's a topmost priority of a diplomat to protect the nation's interest and the nation that they are representing with utmost care, diligence, he is expected to exercise diligence, integrity, dignity, restraint, and professionalism. So this is all for bargaining power and the functions of a diplomat in brief. Now, Having said this, we wind up with this uh, topic and next class, the class will be a little bit longer. Probably it might go up to two hours, just giving you a heads up. So next lecture, we are going to learn about diplomatic conferences, protocol and procedures and diplomatic mission, mission and Vienna Convention. 
Um, next class is going to be, again, I'm reiterating, reiterating, it's going to be a little longer, so get ready for that. And um, what is my plan is just to, you know, give you enough time to revise before the exams. Are you understanding me? So that you will have at least one week's time or one and a half week's time to, you know, to study and prepare yourself before your final exams. Well, so that's all for this class and your attendance is already taken. I'm noting the attendance as well as your names that are put in the message chat boxes, chat message and uh, iPhone, try to put your name so that I know who you are, iPhone and who's the other person. Yes, that's it. So, okay, that's all. Um, so can one of you recapitulate, that's all attendance is taken. Can one of you recapitulate or say a sentence on chapter two? Yes, madam. Please tell me. Okay, thank you. Uh, in chapter two, we have taken, you know, uh, the types of uh, uh, diplomacy. So uh, types of diplomacy is uh, one of these uh, trade and economic diplomacy, which is type of diplomacy which involves the economy of the country. The second one is a cultural uh, democracy. Uh, mm -hmm. Also, it describes, you know, the uh, specification of the culture of the country and the United Nations and the UNESCO, etc. Uh, digital democracy, immediate democracy, dollar democracy, Gumbert democracy, public democracy, and so on. Very good. Okay. Very nice. Uh, uh, well, I would like to ask you one, one question about the, you know, the diplomatic uh, mission. Okay. Uh, ambassador, uh, consulate, all of it is uh, included. What about the military uh, attache? It depends. The military attache of the... Uh, it depends, okay. country to country, okay. in what way and who are the diplomats there and how they regard themselves as diplomats, depending upon the protocols of that particular nation. Okay, thank you, madam. Now, how they represent their particular country. It's a good question, but I understand, but it depends again from country to country. And whether they are given oh, thank that, you, madam. Uh, yeah, they are given that particular, uh, you know, status of a diplomat. Yes, madam. Yes. Uh, before you wind up, uh, before you have started the lecture of today, you have talked about yeah yeah about some issues about bargaining power so i was just writing some notes good uh you have talked about uh, treaty signatories and ratified so right. sometimes I, <laughs> I i got confused about uh, okay. you you have heard that this country is a signatory but he has not ratified that convention or that treaty Okay. So I want you to make understand about if a country mm. is part of the signatories, mm. at the same time is not ratified that treaty or that convention. Mm. What's what's the difference, please? See, if thank you. See, when you ratify, that means you are a signatory. You have consented. So the the method of ratification is you are you are a signatory to that particular convention. Are you understanding okay. me? That means yes. you have agreed to the contents of that particular convention and you have, you have uh, come to a consensus with the other nations saying that, yes, we have like, for example, the most simplest example